Why are we up actually? My name is Peter Herbst. My nickname is Big B. Um, I've been a paddy instructor for 25 years now. Became an instructor in 95, I think it is. I'm the owner of Reef Divers, which is uh, the oldest paddy dive center in South Africa. I used to skydive. Um, and I loved skydiving. I thought it was really cool. I was in my early, my late 20s, early 30s. This was the, the thing to do or the, the cool sport to do. I was a big boy, always a kind of big boy, bigger than a normal skydiver should be. And then we realized that for four years I've been jumping with a school parachute, which wasn't um, standard. In other words, the reserve chute would have been too small had I had a malfunction, I had to open the suit. So for six months I didn't skydive. And in this six month period, I started looking at something else to do. And at the time I was in the construction in industry and one of the ladies that was selling houses and stuff for us, she collected a group of people because she was scared to start scuba diving. So she got this whole group together. Never forget my first sitting on the bottom of the pool, looking up and thinking, I don't have to go up. I can stay here for as long as my air lasts. Um, that was the first big switch in my head. And the next one came three, three nights later. We were doing our pool sessions in the evenings. And this guy got totally confused. And I sat next to him and I stopped my stuff and I said, dude, do it like this and like this and like this and like this and do it like that. And you know, I'm at the same level as he was. And as I looked in front of me, got my stuff ready, Vitor stood in front of me and had a very thick Polish accent. And Vitor said, buddy, one day you'll be a fucking good instructor. And I decided to become a dive instructor at that particular moment, my third pool session. After I became a, a paddy instructor, a recreational diving instructor, um, Vitor, the guy that did my open water course, um, got together a group of, of, of the reef diver staff at the time and said, guys, I've got, this guy is going to come and talk to us. He's from the UK and he's a nitrox qualified. He's a nitrox instructor. And we're going to talk about this nitrox thing. And this was so 1976. Nitrox, nobody knew what the hell it was. Later on, we found out as I got into the game, it's called the devil's gas and stuff like that. I then uh, went on this nitrox course and it was calculations, it was math. You know, uh, if you this deep with this amount of oxygen, there's a number tied to that. You can stay so long or do this or do that. And I fell in love with it. Seeing fish was cool, but I had to know what fish I saw and who's, who its mother was and how many eggs it lays on a Wednesday morning. I had to know all these things. And the information wasn't always there. All of a sudden, I got, I got this little straw that says, hang on, there's more. And I grabbed that straw. And I then did my nitrox course with another agency, because at that stage, our recreation agency didn't offer technical diving per se, because now because you're breathing a different gas, it becomes technical. And of course, that sucked me down the rabbit hole, because I got into the nitrox course, and at that time, it was not a recreational nitrox course. In order for me to do the nitrox course, I had to do limited decompression, 10 minutes decompression, something called advanced nitrox at the time, because there wasn't a recreational program for nitrox. It just doesn't exist. It very quickly became my passion. Not so much because I could go deeper or longer. That was not actually the driving force. What was the driving force was the knowledge. That's when I did my first decompression dives. That's when I wore my first twin set on my back, two cylinders. That's when I started looking like the picture I imagined a diver to look like the early Jacques Cousteau movies where the guys had all these things on them, you know? So there we are, expedition of three. I thought we were just gonna go dive. And then, uh, on the expedition, oh, Dave's gonna go for a world record, which at the time was um, 160 meters, 200 meters, 160, I think, was the deepest anybody has been on a rebreather. And so, well, I'm chuffed, I'm part of this. And um, so we're doing all these build-up dives. So build-up dives is when you dive deeper and deeper and deeper, and you get your, you know, you sort your equipment out where you, where you if you have a problem, you can get back out safely and everything. My job was to go down to 80 meters and we know the hole was, we had the rough idea of the shape of the hole because of previous sonar stuff and everything. And the plan was I was going to go down here to 80 meters on my own and then shine a light across because the water is so clear you can literally see 200 meters underwater. And then I was supposed to shine a light in that direction so that had, if they went around and they picked up a problem on the furthest point, that instead of having to swim around or go back a long way with the scooters, they could just swim straight for the light. 
and at about 30 meters, I see the two of them coming up. And I'm like, what's happening to my dive? And they said, no, 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 no. And they showed me the one scooter and the propeller came off on the scooter. So I thought, oh, well, okay, you know, everyone's safe. They did their scooter draw all the way back because the scooter did break. And, uh, and Don said, no, 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 you go. So I thought, okay. And I got to 80 meters. So you have to understand where I was to understand my feeling at the moment. We know this hole was 280, 290 meters deep. It's a water-filled cavity. You enter the cave outside the water, and then there's this, this cathedral under, 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 under the earth. And since I was young, I could always do this. I call it now, I call it the Google Earth thing, it's where you, you look at where you are, and you kind of like fly up, 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 till you get like above South Africa. You go, oh, well, that's, that's where I am. And you realize how in insignificant you actually are. So I basically just held on to the light, made sure it was there, hold my torch. Oh, it's very, very dark and everything. And I was sitting there, and I did this thing. I did this zoom out, this Google Earth thing. And, you know, first I went up to the water level, which is a small puddle at the top of the... No, it's a small puddle at the top, which is at the bottom of an 80 meter cliff, <clears throat> you know, which is a hill. And then you go from the puddle, you go up this massive hole in the earth, a dry hole. You get to the top of the hill and you keep on going up and then you're in the Kalahari, this desert, where there's nothing. And you keep on going out and you realize where you are and 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 you and i, and I wrote an article about this years ago i said um i think my words were no matter what your perception or of, 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 of a religion or a religious entity or something is whatever whatever your god whatever you perceive god to be if you sit there and you you do this you go hang on you know you you realize the minuteness of your your mortality you, you're nothing <laughs> you know you can make little ripples in life but jesus you can't change shit it's really, it's amazing. I think when you go underwater for the first time, you have half a brain, your perception changes. Because you see, what you see is above the water. You see the beautiful ocean and the sun sets and suddenly you see, and you see, hang on, you saw three fins on the surface. There's a hundred dolphins under the water. And you start thinking, there's more to this than just me. Your perception changes. People need to see that. If they don't see that, they, they don't get that, they never do.